Thank you so much for the invitation to uh, be with you today. Um, this is a talk that actually is going to be reasonably in line with what was advertised. Uh, <laughs> many times you give a title and a little pricey months ahead before you've even thought about what you're going to talk about. This is uh, going to be reasonably accurate. Um, and I worried for a long time as to how I was going to open the talk because what I want to do in talking about collaborations and ground, grounded in what I see to be the purpose of the university. I was a little intimidated coming to this group since you all know the purpose of the university <laughs> about why I would need to do that. Uh, but we really do need to reiterate what we see to be the purpose of the university given what's going on. You know, where university presidents see themselves and many of them across the country call themselves CEOs. Uh, I'm not sure your president has done that, but uh, Others have where they see students as customers and use that rhetoric. Uh, where the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada uh, tries to strip, uh, limit the meaning of academic freedom in their uh, policy statement, their first policy statement in uh, 10, 20, in 22 years. No, I'm wrong about that. Uh, yeah, 22 years and on their 100th anniversary. Uh, issued a statement about what academic freedom was that was appropriate for their 100th anniversary because it was trying to take the concept back to what it had been 100 years ago. Um, where we have our human resources policies of universities that are modeled more on Walmart than on what's proper for an institution, uh, growing reliance on contingent labor, uh, so much so in the United States, uh, more than 70% of the faculty at four-year degree-granting institutions are neither tenured nor tenure-track but in contingent positions. We don't know what the numbers are in Canada because StatsCan stopped collecting data on part-time faculty in 1991. Where governments are looking at key performance indicators, outputs to determine how much funding to give universities. You have the state of Tennessee now, as I understand, that uh, the principal variable as to how much money a university gets is the, uh, hi Jim, uh, is the uh, amount of money, I mean the number of graduates and, and the success rate of, of graduates. Um, where you have the OECD uh, uh, encouraging, it's a HELO project, uh, Assessment of Higher Education Learning Outcomes, which is basically to try to introduce a standardized tests at the post-secondary level as a way to compare the quality, allegedly, of, of uh, post-secondary education in different countries and different institutions. Um, where you have UBC, uh, I don't know if you knew this, it affects all of you, last week the UBC board passed a policy, uh, and I quote, in order to facilitate collaboration with colleagues and enable departments to support outstanding teaching, if a UBC instructor makes his or her teaching materials available for use by others. So if you show your lecture notes to somebody, if you share your syllabus with uh, somebody, uh, by the way, uh, teaching materials in the policy it says, for example, syllabi, lessons plans, lecture notes, instructional modules, class handouts, quizzes, problem-based learning materials, and examinations. If you so much as allow anyone else to see it, and you haven't written on it uh, not to be used by others, the policy says that uh, unless the instructor places restrictions on the teaching materials, UBC may, through its faculties, departments, and individual instructors, use, revise, and allow other UBC instructors to use and revise the teaching materials. So intellectual property rights are out the window. Uh, you own your intellectual property, but by the mere fact of letting somebody see it, they have full right to take it, to change it. There are no moral rights. There is no nothing. And this was unilaterally adopted by the first university in the country to ever do anything like that. So, I mean, the context, I'm just mentioning these various things. So the context is a fundamental transformation of the vision of, of what post-secondary education for a long time we've been using the term corporatization, and these are manifestations of that. Uh, Bill Bruno, our colleague here, uh, shared this uh, statement with me from 1973 when UBC President Kenny began his reforms, followed by changes in the upper bureaucracy, increasing pressure on faculty to report, intensified by a campaign begun under President Strangway to show that UBC was a willing partner uh, in industry, has changed the original public good, public service orientation of UBC, and displaced the locus of academic authority. Now, you know, in some sense, uh, we're seeing this in uh, different vision of what's important in our granting councils. 
Shirk last uh, at the end of last month uh, issued a, a request for proposals uh, under the title "Strengthening Par Research Partnerships Between Post-Secondary Institutions and Industry," and this is a quote from the RFP that they issued. So th they're calling for uh, a project that they're going to fund to the tune of seven million dollars. Uh, to enhance the engagement of industry partners and research partnerships related to the social sciences and humanities. Um, and then it describes the, what the goal of all of this is. Uh, and it goes on to make clear when it's talking about industry, it's not sort of loose, not, you know, non-profit as well, profit. For sure, industry is defined as a for-profit organization or an organization that assists, supports, and connects and or represents the common interests of a group of for-profit incorporated organization, such as... An so here's our Social Science and Humanities Research Council as one of its priorities, trying to develop greater partnerships between universities and for-profit corporations. Now one can imagine in some ways how one can do that in the social sciences. It would be harder to imagine how one does that in history or philosophy or uh, English, but who knows. Or NSERC, just to give you one other example. NSERC now spends $21.8 million on an engaged grants program. And on its website, it describes the engaged grants program, supporting short-term research and development projects aimed at addressing a company-specific problem in the natural sciences or engineering fields. So here, Shirk, I mean, NSERC using already restricted monies to fund what industry should fund. I mean, if General Motors has a short-term company-specific problem, it should hire somebody and fix it. It shouldn't be using public money to have uh, NSERC fund the fixing of its... Or this is from the latest statement of priorities in, uh, for 2013-14. NSERC will work with the Industrial Research Assistance Program to assess and implement tools to link the expertise base with the NSERC systems with the new concierge service. What that is, is the Minister of Science and Technology announced a year ago that the National Research Council was being changed and was going to become a concierge service for the business community. So there would be one uh, telephone number where businesses would call to get their needs addressed. Now we have NSERC uh, making one of its priorities to fit NSERC into this concierge service for business. Or best yet, and best in the sense of most illustrative. This is uh, NSERC's recent um, report on its spending priorities and, and how they've changed from 2010-11 to 2013-14. So the first category, people, research talent, is funding for graduate students. And it's declined over that period by 22.2%. The second ca category is the advancement of knowledge. It's declined by 15.9%. Third category is, is, in, is partnerships. Uh, and that's gone up by 22.1%. Now, none of this should be, uh, I mean, you just look at the, you see what the values and priorities are. So, I mean, none of this is, uh, should be new to us. Thorsten Veblen wrote uh, almost 100 years ago commenting about uh, the business-like spirit of latter-day educators and, and uh, uh, they're substituting the pursuit of gain and expenditure in place of the pursuit of knowledge. Uh, and there's been no shortage of work since uh, Veblen, uh, an outpouring over the last decade or two from Sheila Slaughter and Larry uh, Leslie's uh, academic capitalism, Bill Redding's, I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. Uh, I mean, we should well know uh, about corporatization. What I'm going to be talking about today is another facet of corporatization. It's... Um, about university collaborations, but I want to preface it, as I said at the beginning, by talking about the purpose of the university, which is getting lost in all of this. Um, and I still have the simplistic notion that the purpose of the university is threefold, the advancement of knowledge, the preservation and dissemination of knowledge, and the education of students. And that's made possible by academic freedom and four aspects of academic freedom, academic freedom in teaching, academic freedom in research and scholarship, intramural academic freedom, that is the academic freedom to be critical of the university, the administration, and anything that happens within it, and extramural academic freedom, that is the right of academic staff to exercise their rights as a citizen without being penalized by uh, the employer. Um, 
the second aspect that makes it possible is collegial governance. And I'm not talking about the formal structures, which are imperfect replications of collegial governance, but the notion that acad what, you know, the academic decisions that are made in university are best made uh, primarily by the academic staff. So these are the two things that I think distinguish a university, the kind of academic freedom that's not a perk that we are entitled to because we're special people, but a right that we need to have in order to be able to do our jobs. We can't advance knowledge unless we have the freedom to pursue ideas, whether or not they're popular, whether or not the president of the university or a board member or a corporation or a church or some other body or one's colleagues think uh, that they're uh, appropriate or inappropriate. And we have to have the academics uh, being central to the academic decision making within the institution. So if those are the key elements of a university, then what happens when a university enters into collaborations? What tweaked CET's interest was this study that was done in, published in, 19, in 2010 by the Center for American Progress in the United States called Big Oil Goes to College. They did an analysis of 10 research collaborations between major universities and major uh, oil companies. Uh, this is a list of the collaborations. Um, and as you can see, the total value of those collaborations is uh, more than three quarters of a billion dollars. Um, you know, the one between University of California, Berkeley, and British Petroleum is the largest at half a billion dollars, a 10 year collaboration. Uh, the one with Stanford and a series of corporations, including ExxonMobil and General Electric and Toyota and Schulmerger, uh, for a, a quarter of a billion dollars, and the other. So, um, they had a difficult time doing this study because none of the agreements setting up these collaborations were public documents. Uh, they spent a good deal of money and several years getting copies of the agreements to see exactly what the universities had agreed to. Had to use access to information. There were another uh, dozen or so collaborations where they could never get the documentation. And what they found was quite worrying. So in nine of the 10 agreements, the university failed to retain majority academic control over the central body charged with directing the university industry alliance. And in fact, in four of the 10, the university actually gave complete control to the in industry sponsor for all aspects of governance of the collaboration. Uh, in eight of the 10 agreements, uh, the corporate sponsor is permitted to fully control both the evaluation and selection of faculty research proposals in each grant cycle. None of the 10 agreements requires faculty research proposals to be evaluated and awarded uh, as a result of peer review or through the process of peer review, none of them. Eight of the 10 agreements fail to specify transparently in advance uh, how faculty can apply for funding and what the specific evaluation selection criteria will be. Nine uh, uh, of the 10 agreements call for no specific management of financial conflicts of interest related to the alliance. Uh, and none of them, for example, says that those in charge of awarding the money can't award it to themselves. Um, now, the, the good news was that nine of the 10 agreements affirmed the university's right to publish. But in practice, that right was abridged in virtually all of the agreements because of various uh, loopholes in the wording. Now, the National Institutes of Health in the United States recommends that there be no more than a 60-day delay that um, a partner or a sponsor can impose on an academic's research. And the reason for the uh, 60 days is to give time to patent anything that may uh, be required to be patented. And, and 60 days would be more than enough time. None of the agreements had an effective 60-day limit on the uh, length of time that a sponsor or a corporate partner could delay publication. And in some cases, the consequences for graduate students were particularly serious because they'd have their uh, dissertations that could be suppressed for uh, a year or two uh, under the terms of these agreements. So that uh, generated a lot of interest on our part as to whether this would likely be the situation in Canada. So um, I uh, assigned several of our staff to identify major research collaborations or program collaborations between Canadian universities and industry or other foundations. 
Um, and they spent a good deal of time identifying them. A lot of them were false positives. That is, they looked like a collaboration, but they were, in fact, a, an elaborate thing where they had named a building. There was something that would have a name that you'd think was a, a collaboration, but in fact, uh, there's one at uh, Memorial where there's a building, but it's just um, the building is named after Inco, but what goes on, it's just a classroom building and so forth. Um, and we weren't interested in donations or other, you know, uh, uh, at, uh, <clears throat> at the University of Manitoba, the Faculty of Environmental Sciences was named after Clayton Riddell, who's the uh, uh, CEO of Paramount Oil and Gas, and uh, uh, had donated some money to the university. But uh, we're, we're, not, we're interested in real ongoing collaborations, either in research or in, in programs. So we identified about 20 of them, and then it took two years to get the documentation, because in almost every case, the, rec the documents were secret. And we had to fight through access to information to get the documentation. And most universities actively resisted uh, the release of it. In one case, it was finally, it was with a, it was an agreement between a university and a major donor's own personal foundation. Finally, the donor said, oh, the hell with it, just give it to them. Uh, the university was still holding forth that they weren't going to release it. Uh, we then published the, uh, this report uh, of what we found entitled Open for Business on What Terms. Uh, it's available on our website uh, uh, if you have an interest in looking at it. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about each of the various collaborations, but give you an overview of what we found and then what we think needs to be done and then hopefully open it up to some discussion of, of these matters. So the the uh, research. So there were twelve collaborations that we looked at. Seven of them were research collaborations, and five of them were program collaborations. So one is the Consortium for Research and Innovation in the Aerospace Industry in Quebec. It's a collaboration that began with McGill and a few others, and Pratt and Whitney and a few big aerospace companies, but has blossomed now into involving fourteen universities, virtually all the universities in Quebec, plus some in Ontario, such as the University of Ottawa nine research centers, and 52 aerospace companies, from very large ones to smaller ones. A second uh, is the Alberta Ingenuity Center in in situ energy, which is a partnership between the University of Calgary and a series of energy companies like Shell and ConocoPhillips. <coughs> uh, the third is the Center for Oil Sands Innovation. It's my favorite because its acronym is COSI which fairly accurately describes the relationship between the University of Alberta and Imperial Oil. Um, the Alberta government in both of these has put in money through a crown corporation that's created called Alberta Innovates. There's a series of Alberta Innovates. Uh, in each case, it, this is the Alberta Innovates Energy and Environment Solutions. Calgary is also a partner with a number of oil companies in another uh, uh, collaboration that has the acronym of CHORUS, uh, the Consortium for Heavy Oil Research by University Scientists. I wonder sometimes if the people who will write the greetings and Hallmark greeting cards also uh, come up with uh, acronyms for these uh, partnerships. Uh, and then the Enbridge Center for Corporate Sustainability, uh, again Calgary with Enbridge. Uh, two of them are at UBC. One is the Mineral Deposit Research Unit which is a partnership between UBC and a whole series of mining companies. This is a different kind where companies can put in a small amount of money and be part of it, um, and not the next year. Uh, and then the Vancouver Prostate Center, which is a partnership with UBC, Pfizer, and the BC Cancer Agency. Uh, Pfizer put up, uh, I think it was $9 million initially for this, for a three-year study. To this day, we have not been able to get from either Pfizer or the University of British Columbia an acknowledgement of whether that was renewed. They fought us tooth and nail under the access to information, so we actually still don't know Pfizer's current role. Um, in terms of program collaborations, these are to create academic programs. Uh, some of them don't have names, that's why I just put in partnership. One is a partnership between the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, as well as Durham College, which is on the same campus as you owe it, with Ontario Power Generation, which is the operational part of the old Ontario Hydro. Uh, the second one is the Monk School of Global Affairs, where Professor Toop is going to go to be the head, uh, which is a partnership between uh, the University of Toronto and uh, Peter and Melanie Monk Charitable Foundation. Uh, Peter Monk was the uh, president and CEO of, of uh, Barrick Gold. 
uh, the Ontario government also put in a substantial amount of money to match what had been put in by Monk. The third is the Balsillie School of International Affairs, which is a partnership between Waterloo and Wilfrid Laurie on the one hand, and Jim Balsillie's private think tank, the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG. Uh, in negotiating this, Balsillie said he'd put up his $30 million as long as the Ontario government matched it, which it agreed to do. Uh, two final partnerships, one is between the University of Toronto and Pierre Lassonde and Gold Corp, one of the world's largest gold mining corporations, and Pierre Lassonde was the CEO of that, uh, now retired. And the other is a partnership in mining law at the University of Western Ontario, uh, which is a partnership between a very large law firm called Castles Brock and Blackwell, which came to the university proposing to create a new program in mining law. Uh, so the university and the law firm are the partners in that. Now, what we wanted to do is identify what are the basic principles that we sh sh by which or through which you, we should evaluate partnerships. And we developed uh, a number of them. Uh, the highlights are the terms of the proposed collaboration should be available to the university community so that they can participate meaningfully in the decision about whether the university should enter into the collaboration. Faculty and researchers involved in donor agreements and or collaborative arrangements must have explicit protection for their academic freedom. That should be written into the agreement. In no case should a funder or private collaborator or their representatives have any role in deciding matters related to the academic affairs of the institution or the academic aspects of the collaboration. This has come up, for example, in the program collaboration. Should the corporate partner have a say in what students are admitted to the program, what students should get fellowships, uh, what uh, research, uh, who should get, be awarded the research, and so forth. Clear detail must be provided about how faculty may apply for funding and about what evaluation and selection criteria will be used. Uh, any grants or research funding should be evaluated and awarded using academic methods of independent, impartial peer review. Now, you know, I shouldn't be having to list off these things because they should be obvious, and, and every you know we shouldn't have to be persuading universities that they should adopt these principles. They should, in fact, be the ones identifying them and insisting upon them. The planning, design, data collection, analysis, and dissemination of results should be under the control of the researchers, not the donor or the organizational partner. Collaborators have no right to change the content of publications, nor permit delays in publication for longer than 60 days, and then only if there's a compelling reason for the delay. Relationships between faculty members and graduate students should be safeguarded by ensuring a bright line between the involvement or non-involvement of graduate students in collaborative agreements and their admission, program choices, and evaluation. This has been an issue in some of the ones in the states where uh, <coughs> graduate students who chose not to be engaged with a faculty member who was not engaged in a major collaboration like the one at Berkeley uh, would find that their careers in the department were stunted or in otherwise negatively affected. Uh, there must be no negative impact on the work of those within the department, faculty, or university who choose not to be part of the collaborative arrangement. So you can imagine um, at, uh, at Berkeley where you have a half a billion dollars coming in in a program for a particular faculty, what a distortive effect that can have on everybody in the place and what happens for those who choose not to participate. So we feel that there has to be clear guidelines. Uh, intellectual property rights should be consistent with the faculty association collective agreement, or if there's not uh, a collective agreement with the generally accepted practices in Canadian universities, which with regard to copyright is simple and clear almost everywhere, namely that uh, you own the copyright and have control over it, the very thing that UBC board is trying, governors is trying to change here. Researchers and their immediate family should have no direct or indirect financial interest in any organization funding a collaborative or agreement, and no member of the university's senior administration should have direct or indirect financial interest in any donor or collaborative partner organization. An independent post-agreement evaluation plan must be part of the agreement. The results of the evaluation should be a public document readily available to the academic community. This actually came up in an earlier agreement at Berkeley between Berkeley's Department of Biology and Novartis. Uh, over which there was enormous controversy at the outset, and one of the trade-offs was that they would agree to have an independent research group, it happened to be from Michigan State, who would come in and evaluate it afterwards. And there's been a very fine book written 
uh, about that and some of the serious problems in these uh, that arose in that partnership. And we feel that there really needs to be this kind of independent post-agreement uh, evaluation to see what lessons can be learned. So how did the 12 collaborations measure up? Um, I'll defer to the book, and as I say, I'm not going to try to go through the details. There's uh, many, many pages on each collaboration. So this is just a quick overview. What about transparency? Terms of 10 of the 12 were secret. Only two of them uh, did. Uh, they were secret in all of them before the collaboration uh, was assigned. Subsequent to the implementation of it, 10 remained secret and were available to no one, and we had to fight to get them through access to information. Two of them were public. Uh, academic freedom. Seven of the 12 had no specific protections for academic freedom. And the issues of academic freedom can become unclear in these collaborations because it's a joint partnership. Do the rules that apply in the university apply in this partnership? Um, and the easy way to solve any ambiguity is to have it spelled out, as it was in five of the 12, in the agreement. Does the university retain complete control over all academic matters in the partnership? Uh, six of the 12 had no provision ensuring that. Disclosure of conflicts of interest. Now, this is, not ha this is not a ban on conflicts of interest. This is simply a requirement you disclose conflicts of interest. Only one required disclosure of conflicts of interest. Um, now, this is a ban on conflicts of interest. Only one prohibited financial conflicts of interest. Right to publish. Five protected faculty members' right to publish, five did not, and two, it was not clear from the documentation as to whether it was protected or not. Uh, with regard to the recruitment and evaluation of postdocs and faculty members uh, being protected uh, from being influenced by their potential involvement or non-involvement in the collaborative project, six, uh, I'm sorry, there's a typo there, six had no such protection, six had that protection written in. Um, was there a mechanism for regular publicly available assessments of the effects and effectiveness of each of these agreements? I mean, many of these agreements are controversial. The Monk Center of Toronto, because it was one of the ones that was open uh, after it was signed, uh, so everyone in the community, there were lots of questions raised about were these fair trade-offs and was this going to work or not. So a mechanism to allow regular assessments, in our view, should be built in. No agreement had that provision. What about uh, the post-agreement evaluation plan? Only one had it. It was absent in 11. Um, and the only one that had it is the Mineral Deposit Research Unit here at UBC. Now, looking now just at the research collaborations, there are some questions that only apply in the event of, of research collaborations. Uh, are the funding decisions based on peer review? Only one of the seven collaborations is the money awarded by peer review. Clear details about how faculty can apply for funding and what evaluation and selection criteria will be used. Only three of the seven met that requirement. And researchers having assured access to all the data collected, only three of the seven had that provision. So, I mean, we, we were deeply troubled by these findings. Uh, things that we shouldn't be having to urge universities to protect should be things universities should be insisting on protecting. Um, when, if Imperial Oil wants research done on some aspect of its work on the, on the oil sands, it can hire scientists to do that work. And that's perfectly appropriate. If it wants to do it in partnership with the University of Alberta, it wants to do it in partnership with the University of Alberta for a specific reason. Namely, it wants access to the resources and credibility of the university. And for the university to agree to that, then it should say, well, in a university, given our mandate, things are different than if they were being done in your in-house research lab. And so the price for doing it in partnership with us is a recognition of academic freedom, is that our researchers will have the right to publish, is that the university will insist upon control over all academic aspects related to this project, and so forth. And what's troubling about this is in the majority of cases, Canadian universities failed to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's good that there were uh, two 
of the research collaborations that actually met most of these criteria, uh, or two of the collaborations that met, mo met most of our criteria. One, interestingly, was the one between University of Toronto and Gold Corp, one of the more disliked gold mining corporations. Uh, but apparently the University of Toronto insisted upon this and in its agreement with Pierre Lassonde and Gold Corp, uh, all of the things that we want were protected. Uh, a second one uh, was the agreement between Jim Balsillie's private think tank and Wilfrid Laurier and Waterloo, which is fine now. Now it's fine now because CUT had to fight a two-year battle to get it changed uh, and came to the verge of censuring the two universities if they didn't change it. Uh, and to the credit uh, of the presidents of the two universities, they finally intervened and we met and they agreed to make the changes so that it was absolutely clear that the universities have control over all academic aspects uh, of that program <coughs> collaboration. Um, I suspect that one of the reasons there's a reluctance to be transparent is that when the terms of these collaborations become visible to many of our colleagues, they raise objections. Uh, and I'll talk about an example of that in a moment. So what are, we, what are we academic staff to do in an era where in universities it seems as almost everything is for sale? Well, one option is to bury our heads in the sand. Another option is to emulate our uh, administrators over many, uh, many of our universities and see dollar signs for what they are and, and warmly embrace them. And the third is to pay attention to what John Polanyi, Canada's uh, eminent Nobel laureate, had to say, which is, I think, absolutely right. At a certain point, we don't have universities anymore, but outlying branches of industry. Then all the things that industry turns to universities for, breadth of knowledge, far time horizons, independent voice, are lost. So starting points of, of what to do, I'd like to suggest some things, and hopefully we can have a discussion about those. The first would be to compile a list of collaborations on your campus. How many collaborations are going on at UBC right now? We don't know. Um, but it would be worthwhile to begin doing that. Secondly, for each one you find, request a copy of the agreement. And if you aren't given it willingly, we'll certainly hap happily assist you in getting it through access to information. Thirdly, uh, it's useful to develop a set of principles to guide academic collaborations and then evaluate each agreement uh, against those principles. I'm going to give you some references at the end where our principles are available. Uh, the ones developed by the American Association of University Professors is available. Uh, but it's important to have that template uh, against which you're going to evaluate each of these collaborations. Then make the principles you developed a university policy. Insist that the university adopt that as a policy. And then embed that policy in the collective agreement so the faculty association can enforce it. Since university policies are an important first step, but as we all know, they aren't enforceable. Uh, and then demand openness in the future. The proposed terms are shared with the university community before the collaboration is finalized so that all, at least all the faculty and students in whatever faculty or department or institute or center are going to be central to the collaboration will have an opportunity to evaluate it and decide whether they feel it's appropriate. Now there's a danger, as I was saying before, when you're open in this way. And the danger was best shown at York University, at Osgoode Hall Law School. Because Jim Balsillie's private think tank uh, that I mentioned before, CG, uh, Balsillie had approached uh, Osgoode Hall and York University to say that he wanted to fund, uh, in partnership with the Ontario government, a new program in an international law that would be run jointly by Osgoode Hall Law School at York and his Center for International Governance Innovation. Um, and that he would put up, I believe it was $30 million, the Ontario government would match it, York would kick in and would be taught by the faculty in Osgoode Hall. Um, and the university signed the agreement. And then, unfortunately for the university, some faculty were given copies of it. And the agreement was so horrific in that it gave Balsillie's think tank uh, 
uh, control over a variety of academic matters or a significant voice in a variety of academic matters, um, that there was kickback. A, more than a, a quarter of all faculty at York University signed a petition telling the university that if this couldn't be changed to be made acceptable, the university had to walk away from it. What was even more devastating was the faculty, after four months of discussion and debate at Osgoode Hall Law School, voted overwhelmingly that they would not participate. And that killed it. York wouldn't, and, and, and uh, Balsili wouldn't change it. So the faculty said, well, you know, you can't have this collaboration without us. And they walked away from it. Um, and so that's the, the final starting point is uh, faculty, uh, you know, this can't work without us. And sometimes we have to exercise that uh, right. So some issues to explore. Uh, the issue Tom raised about individual conflicts of interest. How do we deal with that? Uh, several, for those of you who don't, there are three of the distinguished members of the uh, Therapeutics Initiative here who have very strict uh, individual conflict of interest rules to be part of the Therapeutics Initiative. They might share that with you. Um, but we have to think that through because as there are more and more partnerships, and there's nothing wrong in the abstract with partnerships, the issues of conflict of interest become serious ones that have to be addressed. And anyone who thinks that <coughs> conflicts don't have an impact, uh, I'd invite uh, Jim uh, or one of the others to talk about the research that's been on you know, the drug companies spend, how much is it per physician per year? Uh, I saw some figure. 15,000. 15? 20, 15 to 20,000 per physician on pens and trips and lunches and others. And every physician I know who takes these things says, oh, that has no impact on me. I, you think I'm going to compromise what I do with a patient because I get a pen or I get a trip or I'm invited to speak at a conference in Hawaii or whatever. Uh, but the drug companies spend billions of dollars on this, and they're not stupid. So this is an issue we have to think more about collectively. But we also have to think about institutional conflicts of interest. There's an article published uh, by Sheila Slaughter and colleagues in, uh, that I'll show you at the end that's addressing uh, this with regard to uh, universities and corporations that are in partnerships looking to the extent to which they start to overlap in, in areas in which they patent and, and how much the partnership is driving uh, the work within the university. Um, so the whole issue of institutional conflicts of interest are ones uh, looking at who's on boards of governors of universities and what kind of partnerships and what kind of research uh, gets privileged within the institution. Um, we also have to explore more how collaboration can affect curriculum. Uh, you know, the, uh, the collaboration that was between Novartis and uh, the biology department at Berkeley had a major impact on curriculum. And it's not necessarily a desirable one. Uh, on graduate student dissertation and funding options. On opportunities for faculty who do not participate in the collaboration. On academic freedom for those who do on hiring. You know, if you're in a partnership uh, in uh, you know, the Department of Engineering, a uh, $40 million partnership with several energy companies, does that have an impact on who the department hires, uh, who it wants to hire, how it evaluates people? Does it have an impact on promotion? Uh, does it have an impact on graduate student admission? Uh, I think these are all issues that uh, we need to explore more. So here are some of the references, um, and I'll, I'll give you the PowerPoint, uh, to the uh, Big Oil Goes to College, uh, uh, to our, our report, uh, to our guiding principles, to the AAUP's guiding principles. Um, there's a wonderful article in a book that uh, um, is being published next month uh, that I'm editing by Sheldon Krimsky. I don't know if some of you know his work. Uh, um, looking at aspects of this, and I'd strongly recommend that article, as well as the article in the latest issue of the Journal of Higher Education by Sheila Slaughter and colleagues on institutional conflicts of interest.